Okay, can you hear me guys? Can you hear me just well? Okay, so I guess it's time to start. Sorry for the delay, but I was told that I had to finish. Uh, I had to start just on the time and also finish on the, uh, on the time. So, uh, hey guys, my name is Michael Prioznik. Uh, I am a senior software engineer here at Red Hat. And for all of the time I've been employed there, I've been working on Libreard. Um, and today I'd like to tell you how you can perform in student virtual machines using just like the tool. Um, so firstly, what Libreard is? Well, no, firstly, let me start with a question. Who here has ever heard about Libreard? Who you know, oh, wow, cool. <laughs> and who, well, yeah, <laughs> and who hasn't? One, two, okay. So, uh, majority here, you have to bear with me a couple of slides in the beginning because I had to explain what Libreard is for those who, who doesn't know. So, uh, if you guys have ever played with the virtual machines, like, you know, hypervisors, you probably notice that uh, each one of them is being controlled uh, completely different. For instance, in QMU, you have to build this uh, command line where you specify all the device devices that you, that you want your domain to have. Uh, whereas in, for instance, VirtualBox, uh, you have to click it in their GUI or just use some API they expose. Uh, in Zen, you have to create a config file and stuff like that. So, uh, Libreard's aim is basically to hide all these details from you and create a unified uh, configuration and basically management system uh, so that you don't have to bother with all these details and just basically use the virtualization uh, and benefit from it. Uh, we are basically implemented in a C, which means we are a C library, we are a standard C library. However, we do expose our APIs in many other languages out there like, like Perl, Python, Java, Ruby, whatever you name it. <clears throat> so we are basically not uh, limited to use Libreard in your project um, from this point of view. Uh, we do provide a stable API, which means whenever an API has been released, we keep it around for the rest of uh, Libre's lifetime, and we try not to break it. Um, and as a part of that, uh, the configuration itself, configuration format, um, is considered stable as well. And, it, and as I said earlier, we have support for many uh, hi uh, hypervisors out there like KMU, VirtualBox, VMware, uh, Zen in all its flavors, um, using more Linux, believe it or not. Um, and also when it comes to playing with the virtual machines, you know, managing them, you want to prepare the host environment um, some, some way as well. For instance, you want to pre-create all the network devices, um, detach all the PCI devices that you are gonna pass through to your domain and stuff like that. So uh, Libre has a powerful uh, subsystem for that as well. So how does uh, domain configuration or virtual machine configuration in Libre look like? Um, I maybe you know, spoiled something because domains is how we refer to virtual machines in Libre. Uh, fun fact, who knows why do we call them domains and not virtual machines? Okay. Who, who knows and is not a Libre developer? <laughs> um, so it, ha it has a historical background. Uh, I, in order to answer that question, I had to rewind clock back to 2005. That's when uh, Libre project was started. And it started uh, as nothing but a Zen wrapper. And even though we gained support for uh, other hypervisors during the time, we basically stuck with the naming that Zen uses, and you know it's be, uh, referring to virtual machine as domains. Um, so uh, the domain configuration is basically an XML document. Um, yet again, we had we had only two options back then when we started the project. It was either XML uh, or JSON, and the, because the guy who has uh, started the project stands also behind libxml2 and is a part of uh, w3c xml core working group or something. Um, I think the choice we made was pretty obvious. So uh, in, in, the, in the xml, basically the domain configuration is uh, just putting the correct elements into the correct places 
or you know, setting the correct values to those uh, elements and attributes. And uh, this uh, XML not only describe uh, the guest part, uh, the, the guest visible part, but it also describes the host visible part. For instance, uh, here in the emulator tag, I've, uh, I've told Libbeard which emulator binary should be used when trying to execute my, uh, my domain. And also a couple of, you know, what should happen uh, when a lifecycle event occurs. Just a second, please. Mm. Okay. So um, the performance tuning with Libvirt is really just putting the correct values onto correct places within this document. That's it. Libvirt will basically then take care or will take care uh, of the rest, like setting all the knobs in the uh, in the host system. So. Uh, Yet again, a couple of historical backgrounds. Firstly, um, the first approach to virtualization uh, has been so-called full virtualization, uh, which is done today as well, but we will get to it. So uh, when it comes to uh, full virtualization, the hypervisor basically does something called binary translation, which means it scans the code that gets, gets wants to run and replace all the non-virtualizable instructions uh, with some trap, which, which uh, then whenever a guest uh, wants to run such instruction, the trap is hit, uh, the control is handed back to uh, emulator, which will hopefully emulate the instruction and pass the control back to the uh, guest. Um, this, is, this is nice. This has one big advantage, meaning that you don't have to modify your guest at all. You can just take whatever system you have, place it into virtual machine, and run it as is. Uh, however, uh, historically, this hasn't been you know, the, the top level uh, performance possible. So another approach developed, uh, and it was called para-virtualization. Para uh, this is uh, something that, uh, for instance, Zen does. Uh, basically, instead of the hypervisor scanning the guest uh, memory and replacing the, virtual, uh, the, the instructions, the hypervisor will instead expose a set of APIs and let guest call the API whenever it, it wants to you know, do something uh, privileged. The problem with this approach is uh, that you have to modify your guest. Um, and you know, given the rate, how the new software is being released, for instance, nowadays, um, it wouldn't be feasible to you know, catch up and do all the modifications. So um, even though uh, back in the old days, the para-virtualization para has been used a lot, until the hardware vendors came in. They introduced something called hardware-assisted hardware virtualization uh, which basically tries to uh, eliminate the need uh, for the for the para virtualization, uh, and in case you want to check whether your host is capable of of this, uh, you you are looking either either on a VMX CPU flag or SVM CPU flag, depending whether you are running on Intel or AMD architecture. Um, and for some reason, please don't ask me why, uh, this may be not enabled by default on your motherboard. So you need to you know, get your hands dirty and go to BIOS and enable it there. Don't, don't ask me why, I'm, I'm no motherboard vendor. Um, this has been such a breakthrough that many uh, hypervisors are, are built on the top of uh, hardware-assisted virtualization, notably the KVM. Speaking of which, uh, who knows the difference between KVM and QMU? Come on, raise your hands, don't be shy. OK. So for, for those who don't, uh, the KVM is the actual hypervisor doing all, all the, you know, uh, as I've shown here, full virtualization. And the QMU is there to emulate the I.O. So it works like this. Uh, KVM is a loadable module in your kernel. You will, you will have to enable it if already not done by your uh, distro. Um, and 
actually KMU is the one who sets up sets up uh, the or call the you know APIs uh, in the in the in the module. And whenever a guest wants to do some I/O, uh, it gets to KMU, which will then decide where the data should go. Uh, how do you enable hardware-assisted virtualization in the kernel? Uh, oh, sorry, in in, in Libvirt. It's really simple. You just select the correct uh, domain type, which is in this KVM. How does it perform? Well, I've done I've done some testing here on my laptop previously, um, and as you can see, well, I I basically just uh, measured how long does it take for a guest to boot up. So. In, in the KVM case, I, I was able to get shell in somewhere around 10 seconds, including the five seconds group timeout. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and if I wasn't using the KVM or the hardware assisted virtualization, just letting the KMU emulate all the um, instructions in, in uh, memory or in software, uh, after 60 seconds, the guest was still booting up and I couldn't get any shell, um, so I basically just killed it and stopped counting. Um, nevertheless, so we can, we can see the hardware the virtualization is, you know, performs really, really good. However, uh, there are still some cases where we want to uh, join, where we want to have the para virtualization joined in, and it goes like this. So imagine you have some data that you want to send I don't know, for instance, on a network. You want to download something or, you know, uh, or upload. <clears throat> Bless you. <laughs> um, however, since we are still emulating, still the KMU is emulating the real hardware, we have to, uh, the KMU has to emulate it with all drawbacks uh, that it takes. For instance, with all the errors, all the interrupts, and stuff like that. So what if we just instead can take the data from the guest as is, uh, and let just the host deal with them without needing for, you know, to do this all uh, emulation miracle. Um, actually, it's possible. We can use something called weird I.O., which is where the you know, para virtualization kicks in once more. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my, my and it really uh, boots your performance. Um, so basically, the Vertio defines a new set of APIs for the guests to use. Um, and since it's a new device model, you have to have drivers in your guest operating system. Uh, for it to use. However, unless you are running some really ancient system from, I don't know, uh, 40s or something, you, you, can, you, are sure, you can be sure that uh, the drivers are available for you. And the host part drivers, because you know it's still a new device, are basically built in uh, the hypervisor itself. How do you enable Virtio in Libvirt? Well, basically, uh, this, is, this gets uh, a bit tricky because, for instance, for disks, you have to place them onto the correct bus, whereas, for instance, uh, for interfaces, you have to select the correct model. Uh, and same goes for membaloon and stuff. Uh, so before doing this, uh, you should really uh, consult the documentation. But it's, uh, it's really... Um, easy, you just put the correct value, correct virtual word uh, into the correct place, you know, either in attribute or, or element. How does it perform? Uh, so I've done measurement yet again on my laptop. Um, so I've, uh, I've had a guest with, and I've assigned, with, with a network card, and I've assigned uh, multiple um, models to, to it. To the network card, so the the blue bar is some some real tech device. Uh, the red one is an uh, interface, uh, an Intel interface, and the yellow one is Virtio. So we can see uh, with Virtio and one vCPU, I was able to get uh, like 16 uh, gigabits per second, which is you know when, when compared to some Intel with barely two gigabytes, it's really boost. However, 
Uh, you can see some slight decrease here in uh, performance. Um, and I suspect that's because my laptop has only four cores, well, two cores and hyperthreading. So uh, in, uh, in case where I, where I gave it uh, four vCPUs, uh, my, my, my processor has to not only um, process the, the network uh, data, but also uh, process the vCPUs it themselves. So uh, I think that's the reason why. Um, and at this point, I would like to you know, stress one thing that has been um, deserved, that has been demanded for a really long time and has been implemented just quite recently. And it's called Retail GPU. Um, and basically works like this. So uh, you take the uh, OpenGL commands from the guest, pass them through onto your host, and let let the host GPU card render them and basically uh, render them directly into the guest uh, frame buffer. However, this has uh, some limitations because of the process. So for instance, if you want to, um, I don't know, emulate an NVIDIA or an Intel uh, GPU, you really have to have uh, the corresponding card in the host as well, because you know you, you can hardly emulate NVIDIA and have Intel host GPU card, right? Um, and, it, it, and it also uses some uh, uh, host side software, which is called WeirdGL Render. You can check it out uh, online if you want to. So, uh, nice really, so, so now we should do some quiz to, show, to let me know how you pay attention. And it's a great opportunity for you to win scarves. So, <clears throat> the first, first uh, question. What format does uh, Libreed use to store the domain config? Come on. <laughs> Who said it first? <laughs> so I can give him scarf. Okay. Uh, I, st stop by after, after talk and I agree. Okay. Uh, how do you enable hardware-assisted virtualization? Uh, and in Libreed? Nope. Domain type. Stop by, please. And how do you enable Virtio? Yeah, you basically set the uh, set the correct uh, value and uh, to to some attributes and elements. Okay, cool. <coughs> so now I uh, I will uh, I will explain some. Uh, some primitives that are in the Linux kernel that Libreed uses uh, when it comes to, well, much slightly, slightly complicated uh, stuff. And it's C groups. Um, so C groups are a feature of uh, Linux kernel uh, that allows you to either limit or count or basically just isolate some resources that, get this, that hosts have. Um, and not only that, they can be used for prioritization uh, in between process, uh, processes as well. So for instance, if you have, uh, I don't know, this, uh, this greedy uh, application running in your host, you can place it into, into a block IO C group and just basically limits, limit uh, how much bandwidth it has when trying to access a disk. Uh, the, so the C groups that Liberty uses uh, are CPU set uh, this control um, group basically tells where you can have a uh, process running on which host CPUs. Uh, block I.O. described earlier, and memory is basically the same as CPU set, because it, but it only limits the memory. So for instance, it tells on which NUMA nodes uh, you can have, the, or the process can have uh, some memory. Uh, the C groups form some hierarchical tree, but uh, there has been some work in this area lately in the kernel, so uh, uh, maybe this will uh, be obsolete soon. But, you know, uh, previously, you could place uh, the process anywhere within the tree. With a new approach, you can place them only into list, but that's, you know, I, we don't need to get uh, too low level here. So how does uh, Liberty uses these um, when you know, trying to performance boost your, boost your perf uh, virtual machine. Uh, we use it for pinning. So imagine this uh, big 
host uh, with many CPUs and many uh, memory nodes or chunks of memory. Uh, in, in this host, some CPUs are more closer to uh, some chunks of memory than the others, and vice versa. So if you have uh, a domain running, um, which is basically uh, a Linux, traditional Unix, uh, Linux process, uh, you, you want to have the data processing as close to the actual data as possible. So you basically want to uh, tell that my memory should be running here among with my uh, virtual CPUs, and of course, even though you are still using uh, Virtio, hopefully, uh, you emulator is still uh, doing some, some work, so you want to have it as close to the domain as possible. So this is, well, yeah, this is um, slightly complicated to configure in LibWeird, but it's slightly com com uh, complicated stuff anyway. Um, so for instance, in this specific case, I've uh, pinned the virtual CPU number zero and allow it to run on the host CPUs uh, number one, not two, and three and four. Um, the same goes for emulator or for memory and, and stuff. <clears throat> so, um, how you can boost your, your storage? Um, even when it comes to virtualization, you basically have th actually three layers uh, of caching. So the first one is in the host operating system itself. You know, it's an operating system. It has some cache. All the processes on the, on the, on the system have them. Um, the second is in guest operating system, yet again. And the, and the third one is just in, in between them in, in the KMU. Um, and whenever guest wants to write some data, uh, the data has basically uh, has to go through all of these uh, caches unless configured otherwise. However, um, it has some uh, advantages and also disadvantages, you know, uh, playing with the QMU cache. So the QMU cache can basically uh, be turned off using the, the cache none which saves, saves us some time because whenever data uh, has to pass through these layers, um, it has to be copied and you know, it takes some time. Um, however, if for some reason your guest gets disconnected from its storage, uh, the KMU cache can actually save, save you from data loss. So if you trust your guest that this scenario won't happen, uh, if you trust your guest that this, this scenario won't happen, you can turn the KMU cache off. Otherwise, you should, you know, you should be really cautious about it. Uh, one attribute that you may actually see here is the I.O. and it has value of native. The other value it could have is threats. Um, and to, so what does, it, what does this do? I will refer you to the next talk, well, actually, the third talk after me, I guess, uh, where this is going to be explained uh, in much more detail, and I think some performance uh, graphs will be shown as well. <clears throat> so, networking. Um, so, back to my previous example, you have some data that you want to pass onto, onto network. Um, so, not, okay, you are not using Virtio, however, um, how you can enable the, you know, you want to use something even uh, much faster than that, near bare metal or bare metal. Well, you can, you can basically use a PCI pass-through, which is um, you take the PCI device from the host, detach it, and uh, place it into, into your guest and let it use it. However, it has this advantage um, in that sense that nobody else beside the guest itself can use it. So before you try this on your own, please make sure that you are connected either to Wi-Fi or via another interface because you are definitely going to use connectivity. <clears throat> uh, 
So, um, well, yet again, uh, another help from hardware vendors uh, was needed, and they, they have developed something uh, which we call uh, SRIOV, which means that the, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, that the PCI devices are able to create the virtual functions uh, on the fly after, after, the get, after the host operating system is booted up. And uh, you can actually pass through uh, the, only the virtual functions into the guest. So the PCI device is actually, after all, shared uh, with either host or with uh, multiple guests. Um, there's really no miracle here. The bandwidth that uh, such card has, it's basically shared. So mm, you don't, don't expect uh, 10 gigabits on a one gigabit network. <clears throat> so this is how we configure it uh, in, uh, in Libert XML. You basically, in this specific example, I'm using a PCI device on this address uh, on, in the host to be passed through to my guest. And I should mention that uh, these uh, approaches require, yet again, some CPU features. Yeah, no, not only VTX, but also VTD. Anyway, so um, there is a couple of things that uh, you, your, your host should have when trying to do all of this. So is there some tool that you can use to check whether you have everything you need enabled? Yes, there is. Uh, and it's Virtual Validate. It's um, a really small binary that uh, lives in our repository. And it will do all, all the checks uh, that are needed, not only uh, for the KMU, but for containers as well. And it will print basically some really nice output. And if you failed to set something, it will at least give you a hint where you should, um, you know, uh, where you should be aiming when trying to enable it. Um, so, um, my, my enumeration of all the possible, um, you know, values that you can set to performance boot your virtual machine or container um, is, is, also, is not complete and really cannot be complete because um, we have a, a limited time here. But uh, I would, um, refer you to our documentation and also to our Red Hat documentation where uh, this uh, topic is covered in much more detail. And in case you have any questions, feel, please feel free to ask them on our mailing list. And uh, hopefully you will enjoy my demo that I've prepared. Uh, its aim is to show you the, the storage uh, boost and uh, computing boost uh, for the graphs I, I haven't prepared. Uh, just a second. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. And hopefully that's is it, is it visible for you guys? Yeah. yeah. So I have prepared two, two virtual machines and only... Okay, maybe it's two... Too big. Just a second. Uh, yeah. So uh, in the first difference that we can see uh, is yeah. Okay, it works. Uh, so in the DevConf tuned, uh, I I really am uh, pinning the the vCPUs. I'm uh, enabling. Well, basically disabling the, the cache, the, uh, cache none. And I am, the other difference that I got here is I'm using Virtio when compared to, you know, some real tech device. So let me just, uh, yeah. So, for instance, oh, just a second. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is a very small small program that I have uh, in both virtual machines. You can you can see it's 
basically a dummy program to just do some uh, some memory access. So uh, let me let me see uh, how does it perform. How does it perform here on a not tuned machine? Uh, it's gonna take some time, I guess. Meanwhile, I'm gonna run the uh, the same program uh, on the tuned machine. Uh, still working, hopefully. No. Yeah. Uh, when I when I tried it at home, it took like 40 seconds. So please bear with me here. Uh, meanwhile, what we can do uh, is to is to show you how the storage uh, boots up. Super secret password. Nope. Um, so for instance, I can uh, try to write some data uh, on the disk. Uh, for instance, one, one gigabyte, and I'm gonna use um, ah, this is oh, okay, cool. So uh, in the not pinned uh, virtual machine, it took 43 seconds to complete uh, my little test, and in uh, in the tuned, it took only 31 seconds. Cool. Uh, Nice. Um, so uh, the the write speed has been something about you know seven, roughly seventy megabytes per second, whereas in uh, in this one I was able to to get uh, nearly one gigabyte per second, uh, which is just kind of strange because I don't have so fast SSD. Um, nevertheless. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, this this uh, other example I'm showing is probably spoofed. Never mind. Um, so I think that yeah. Do you get a difference of that one with I flag equals full block? Yeah. Uh, full block, sure. I flag equals full block. And uh, okay, and yeah, so over some some, some slightly over six megabytes per uh, six hundred megabytes, and when compared to one hundred fifty, and. Um, Okay, so that actually brings brings me to end of my uh, talk. So the conclusion here is you should enable hardware assisted virtualization whenever possible. You should use prefer virtio, and uh, as you can see, the C, uh, the CPU pinning or actually the pinning itself makes sense on uh, on some small machines as well. But it, you know it's easy, easier to explain on uh, huge machines. So, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Yes? So, so the question was whether uh, the um, computing directly onto, onto uh, GPUs is supported. Um, as far as I know, we are still trying to work on it. There has been some patches on the on, on the upstream list, but frankly, I'm I'm no QME developer. I'm a Libre developer, so I you know I maybe have I may I maybe have delayed something, <laughs> maybe have not seen something and stuff. So you, you should better ask some QME developers. Yeah. Of the host, to the deadline, it actually gave a great performance boost, especially on the storage. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the well, so yeah, so the so the question of basically uh, point uh, was that uh, the host uh, disk scheduler has some influence um, on the on the uh, disk I/O as well or disk performance as well. Yes, it has. Um, from uh, all the all the tests I've made, uh, yes, as you said the. Uh, Deadline scheduler has performed the best. You know, um, try and see whatever suits your workload. Yes? Am I able to put directly the disk? Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Well, basically a partition. No, no, no. I meant if I can put the disk as a hardware device into the virtual machine. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Like PCI device. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why you use C groups uh, instead of directly accessing the CPU of affinity setting in Yeah, so the, so the question was uh, why are we using C groups instead of setting the CPU affinity uh, from within the KMU? Uh, the problem is uh, we want to be able to, uh, to change it afterwards. Because um, sometimes you, you users may have decided uh, that they want to move the the, C, uh, the vCPUs onto some different you know CPU set, and uh, it wouldn't be possible for Libvirt to do so because at that time the KMU is um, itself another process. So we would need to instruct KMU and kindly ask it to move there because you you cannot really modify the affinity from outside the the process. Um, so. We just instead rely on, on C groups. Yeah? Sorry? Uh, that's already implement, implemented. Yeah. It's, it's in the docs. If you, if you check them, you will find. Okay, so if no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you. So, I'm writing a book about 